All right, we are this week we're transitioning from the federal court system to the state court system. Uh, chapter four. Um, well, just a quick review on the, the federal court systems. How many levels do we have in the, the federal court system? Fast start. What's the highest level of the federal court system? Okay. There we go. Perfect. Supreme Court system. And then low, we have lower level just, uh, district courts, circuit courts, and then the uh, appellate courts. The appellate courts, the district courts, the district appellate courts, if they set precedent, who do they, who has to listen to those? Who has to obey precedent from a district appellate court? Right. What district are we in here? Uh, and then if we want precedent for case law, which is kind of interchangeable, precedent and case law, uh, if we want that to be nationwide, who's the only person, who's the only uh, body that can set national precedent? Yeah, exactly. So in much that same structure, whether it's lower and middle and high courts, uh, the, the state courts have those. We're going to go over them. But we'll just go over just a little bit of history first. So even though we call them state courts, the state courts were long before we were actually in the United States. They're still in the colonial days. The 13 colonies each had their own court systems, if you will. But because we weren't even a country, we didn't really know how we were going to be run. We were still essentially English uh citizens because we hadn't declared independence so we're still following english law english rules and under english uh rules english law the governor of any body or for so the colonies or, or or a region in england uh the governor was like the the head of everything the governor would be in charge of the executive branch the judicial branch the legislative branch you know, the governor was setting the rules, the governor was appointing people, the governor was hearing cases sometimes, like, the governor did everything. So, with that in mind, if we, as we come over to the United States as, a, as, as colonies, as, as colonials, we're still obeying those rules. I mean, that's all we've known as, as a new, brand new, we're not even Americans yet, we're still English. It wasn't until later when we started realizing, like, hey, I don't think we're, we're too cool with this, this English rule. Why don't we start? Why don't we try something else? Why don't we become states and then United States of America? And what well, are going to declare independence and say we don't want your your English way? We're going to do it our own way. But until then, we're we're English citizens. Um. So we still had a lot of the you know the same technologies from England that we had uh, once we came over here. And one of the ways we communicated. Or when we say the press, we didn't have news, uh, TV shows. We obviously didn't have the internet and things like that. What was what, what was the where did we get our news in in colonial days, 1700? Sure, word of mouth is, was a huge part of that. We also had written. We also had newspapers. So between word of mouth and newspapers, that's how we got our news. So if the, if I say, keep in mind that I said the governors were, were like the, you know, and view themselves as, as gods almost. Like they, they make all the rules, they, they hear the cases, they uh, appoint folks, remember executive, judicial, and, uh, and legislative, they, they're making laws as well. Then they probably aren't super keen on being criticized. If you look at, I mean, any, it doesn't matter which side of the news you're looking at. Um, CNN, Fox, uh, Breitbart, any, any any news organization is going to have a, a political slant to it. They're going to kind of have their favorite politicians and their not so favorite politicians. And they're going to speak really highly of the politicians they like, whether the, the president that's in, in office or the president used to be in office. They, whoever, whoever they side with, they're going to speak really highly of. And whoever they don't side with, 
I can just talk a lot of smack about it. So if you watch, uh, right now, if you watch Fox News, they're going to talk a lot of smack about our current president because they don't align with his, his beliefs. But four years ago, if you had watched CNN, they'd be talking a lot of smack about Trump because they didn't align with him. And then now the roles are reversed. Now, uh, CNN speaks highly of the current president and, uh, and Fox doesn't, but it just depends. Those are two extremes because of the political ideologies. But nobody gets, nobody gets in trouble for that now, right? You, you don't hear about Fox or any reporter of Fox uh, getting arrested or even getting critiqued about it. Like you can, you can freely say whatever you want for the most part, as long as it's not criminal, uh, about the president for not believe, not, uh, not buying into his ideologies. Or any politician not buying into their ideologies. Um, that brings me to a guy named John Peter Zenger back in the 1700s. He was a, uh, he worked for a newspaper in New York, the colony of New York, and he wrote a bunch of, or he was in charge of people who wrote a bunch of stories uh, about the governor there, the governor of the, of the colony of New York. The governor's name was Cosby, William Cosby. His friends called him Bill, Bill Cosby. I don't really know if he had friends, but if, they, if he did have friends, they probably called him Bill Cosby. So he would, uh, Ziegler would write all these stories about the, the governor, just talk a smack. Like, hey, the governor made these bad decisions. Uh, the governor is appointing people to offices that are his friends. The governor is firing people without cause, and the governor is giving people raises that they don't deserve it. You know, just, just essentially nothing, nothing crazy, but critiquing the governor. We have to bear in mind at that time we didn't have the Bill of Rights. We weren't even, a, you know, we weren't even a country yet, let alone a Constitution or a Declaration of Independence and amendments to the Constitution. So they consider that against the law. What is it if you um, have you guys ever heard of slander? Slander is when you when you talk about somebody, when you say something about somebody that can damage their reputation and it's criminal in nature. Slander in written form is called libel. Same same concept, but just written form versus verbal. So they considered it treasonous or treacherous libel. If you wrote in your newspaper saying all these things about the, the governor, especially since the governor is in charge of making laws, is in charge of appointing judges, and is in charge of hearing cases sometimes, things like that. Ziegler got arrested. He ended up going to, going to trial. And he had to defend himself against these libel charges where all he was saying was what was happening. So he had a couple of choices when he went to court. One, he could plead guilty because he did do what they said he did, the way the laws are written. Uh, but he got an attorney named James Alexander, and the attorney decided not to fight whether or not he did it or not, because that was pretty much out of, I mean, wh wh why do you think it was so easy to prove that he did it? Yeah, it was right there in the paper, like literally in black and white. The, the evidence was all there. So there's no question as to whether or not he did it. So he needed to come up with a defense. How can we defend ourselves, either one, libel or slander? How can we defend ourselves against that? If we, well, one, you can say, I didn't do it, but that's off the table right now. What makes libel or slander okay? Or actually, what makes talking smack okay? Because because if, you, if it's libel or slander, you're fitting the, the definition of the crime. So what, what makes it okay to say bad things about people? Freedom of speech is part of it, but bear in mind, if today, freedom of speech, absolutely. But we didn't have the Bill of Rights back then. We, it wasn't even, it wasn't, we weren't even the United States yet. We were still just colonies. We were still part of England. Let's use me as an example. If you're going to talk, talk about me and you decide to say, um, I'll give you two examples. One is you decide to, to say that uh, I came to work drunk. And it's clear that I didn't. And there's no evidence that I came to work drunk, but that's your, you start telling people that I did that. That could damage my reputation probably, right? But on the other hand, what if um, I start picking favorites and I give, you know, I don't like this half of the class, but I really like this half of the class. 
And so all of you get A's, and I, and I tell them, like, I just, these people are just better people, man, sorry. And I guess you're getting a C because you're in the middle. And all, all F's. No, no good reason, just just don't don't like this. I don't like the left side. Left, left is bad, right is good. And then you complain, this side obviously complains about that. Could that damage my, my reputation? Yeah. yeah. What's the difference between those two stories? The one where I came in a drunk, came in, or the complaint was that I came in drunk versus the complaint where I was giving uh, unearned Fs. I'm sorry. Right, so there was no evidence I came in drunk. In fact, it didn't happen in, in that story. I, did, I didn't come in drunk, but somebody was just making that up. The difference was I really was giving, in that story, I was really giving the, the unearned deaths and the unearned days. So even though both could damage my reputation, one was true. So that's a defense to, to libel. And so if I tried to, whoever's complaining, if I wanted to say, hey, you know, you're, you're, you're slandering me or you're, you're, you're writing down something libelous. If, if I go and try to either sue or, or proceed with the criminal charges for libel or slander on something, and you're like, well, you are doing that, man. Like, Mr. Bill, you, you did do the, the things that we said you did. Then that, that can't be, that's a defense for libel or for slander. So in this case, with Zingler, when he wrote down all those things about the governor, all the smack that he was talking about the governor, the governor really was doing all that. He really was firing people for no cause. He really was giving raises and hiring his own friends and, uh, and appointing people who weren't qualified for the job and all, all those kinds of things that, that Zingler said he did in the paper. So when he went to court, those laws didn't apply. That, that, that exception to libel and slander didn't apply because governors were able to make the, the, the own, their own laws and their own rules and appoint their own judges. So if, if they said, hey, you said bad things about me, it didn't matter if it was true or not. You just weren't allowed to say bad things about the governor. Well, in this case, Alexander, his attorney, decided, you know what, we're going to fight this. We're going to fight the system. And he took it to a jury. And he told the jury, hey, here's what's going on. You guys live here. You're a jury of his peers. You live here. You see the judge. You see William Cosby. You see how bad he is of governor. You see all the things he does. You, you've all seen how true it is what Ziegler was writing. Do you believe that he should go to prison for telling the truth? And they believed it. They only, they only delivered it for 10 minutes. They went out for 10 minutes. They came back and they said, no, that's, that's not liable. You're not in trouble. You're a free man. You get to go. And that's how we began to use that defense of, okay, well, if it's true, then it's not libel or, or slander. So he was able to, to show that that is an allowable, for lack of a better word, smack talk. You, you can say bad things about people if they're doing bad things. Now, had he made up things about the governor, had he created stories and, and started talking all kinds of crazy stuff about him uh, that didn't happen, now we're in a different situation. But now, as we proceed forward through the... Uh, through the next couple hundred years, you'll see that you just can't get in trouble usually nowadays for uh, communicating incidents. This is a question for this week's one question quiz. And the question is, what was John Peter Zinger on trial for? What was John Peter Zinger on trial for? Type your answer into the one question oh, quiz box in this week's Blackboard. The these state court systems, as we're, as we're even becoming states, as we start to start to become states, you have to remember that in the 1700s, it was it was hard to get around. So here we had the, the federal court system. We talked about these traveling judges. That was hard enough. They even had to hire more judges because these traveling judges never got to have some time off. So in order to uh, avoid that system on the state level, and I, I'm going to keep calling it the state level, even though we weren't in the United States yet, but because these, they morphed into the states. So we had these, these townships and little towns. And imagine how many different courthouses you had to have if you had, uh, I mean, it's, it's bad enough at five o'clock trying to get from here to Clayton with cars. Imagine if you had to go to Clayton when there were no cars, or just horses. And then from there, what if you had to get to Raleigh or Durham or, you know, keep going? It's, uh, 
the, the, every single little town started to have their own little magistrate judges. And by, by having every single town, it got really convoluted. Every town started having their own rules. There was no centralized body giving them the uh, direction where one book was telling you exactly how to do things. And we're still following common law a lot of times. We're still following laws that said, hey, I just think that's wrong, even though there's no legislative codified item in a, in a law book, you're going to be found guilty of what we just all know is, is wrong. But sometimes we don't all know the same thing. So bear in mind, even, even with that story with uh, William Cosby, governors were appointing all of the, all of the judges. So the lowest level of judge that, that governors were appointing were called justices of the peace. And they were hearing all the minor, minor cases, what we would consider now to be like uh, infractions, misdemeanors, maybe small civil, uh, civil disputes, things like that. The next level up that they had at that time were our county courts, which we still have. We still have county courts. If you, if you go to, like for the most part, you won't go to the Smithfield courthouse. You're gonna to go to the Johnston County courthouse located in Smithfield. And what happens if you don't like the results of your case at the, the county court? So the county courts are here that you know your uh, more significant cases. If you don't like the results of, of a case, what is your option? Yeah, you can go higher, you can appeal. And back then we still had the option to appeal. But the difference was there wasn't necessarily appellate courts. If we're going to appeal, we've already said that the, the governor is, is the, the head guy or head girl. That's who you're gonna. That's gonna hear your your appellate case, not necessarily an appellate court. Uh, maybe the governor would have a council around him. Might might hear some of them, but still responsible for that council, the governor's council. So the governor or his council or her council is gonna hear the uh, the appellate cases and, and rule on those. So you know, keep think about that Zingler case. What if it hadn't gone his way, and you know the jury had found him? Letter of the law was. We'll back up. We spoke about this in another class. So we have we have two ways of looking at the law: letter of the law and spirit of the law. So we have we have some laws that you have to follow exactly. Like there there are laws in the books that are, that are unsafe speed, where it says if you go sixty six and a sixty five, technically you're breaking the law. You, you can you, you violated that speeding law and if you get pulled over for going 66 and a 65 can you get a ticket sure you can if you didn't get a ticket that would mean that the officer was obeying the letter of the law which says you have to go 65 or below no exceptions but why do we have speeding laws right keep people safe do you believe opinion wise do you believe that 66 miles an hour is less safe than 65? No. Okay. Do you believe that 90 miles an hour is less safe than 65? Okay. So if getting pulled over for 60, if, if the whole reason we have speeding laws is to make sure people are safe, does it make sense to pull somebody over? Uh, or if, if, if you were an officer, she was the officer, but it makes sense for her to pull somebody over for 66 if she doesn't believe that 66 is less safe than 65. At some point we're gonna get there, you know, obviously before 90, I imagine, you know, somewhere we're gonna 70, 75, we're gonna start realizing like, yeah, all right, now we're trying to kind of get to where it's unsafe. If the whole reason, like you're if you're telling the truth when you talk to people and you talk to yourself, you say, Hey, I'm I'm giving tickets because I want people to be safe. And you don't believe that 66 is less safe than 65. Then the only reason you would give a ticket for that, for that is because you're following that letter of the law. If you honestly, if you start not pulling people over until you believe where it's unsafe, then you're following the spirit of the law. The spirit of the law says we're here to keep people safe, we're here to protect people for whatever law it is, from murder down to, to speeding. Spirit of the law is the kind of like a, a lean, more lenient way of, of looking at. So if that jury had looked at the law at that point, the letter of the law said 
hey, if you talk smack about the governor, you're guilty of libel. But how did, did they look at the spirit or did they look at the letter? When they found him innocent or not guilty, they looked at the spirit. The letter of the law said, if you say something bad about the governor, you're in trouble. But the spirit was, hey, you shouldn't be saying bad things about people that they didn't do. But it wasn't written that way. So they looked at that law and said, okay, now we kind of understand why this law, this law is in place because you shouldn't say bad things about people that they didn't do. Because it's going to hurt their reputation. If you were talking about something they did do, who cares about hurts their reputation? It was their decision. So if the jury had seen it uh, and followed it as the, the letter of the law, and decided, hey, we're gonna find this, uh, we're gonna find Zengler guilty. And he decided to appeal that case, where would it have gone? So he was found guilty, he would have been found guilty of libelous writings about the governor. And he said, I don't like that, that decision, I want to appeal it. Where's it gonna go? Who heard appellate cases back then? I'm sorry? Yeah, exactly. So the governor would have heard the case about the governor, a little bit of a conflict of interest. Fortunately, it didn't work out that way. Fortunately, Zegler was found innocent, not guilty. But that's how much power the governor had. I mean, you, how are you supposed to defend yourself against somebody who's who's going to hear that on their own case? So, because there are so many. Uh, so many courts back then. Imagine how small towns were. I mean, even you know, I think we consider Smithfield a fairly small town. I wouldn't say they have the the world's busiest courthouse, but it's enough, it's got enough business to keep them in, in business for every day. But back then, we so every every little group of people formed a little town, and they had their own magistrate court or, or, or district court. They didn't necessarily need to meet every day. Some courts were meeting monthly. Uh, there were courts in New York that were meeting every six months. Uh, just just depending on how how quickly how much of a caseload they needed it to have, and they would meet that often. So it wasn't like a, a full time job per se. Uh, and we're still at that point, you know, as people were being charged with crimes, there wasn't a dedicated uh, person to represent the people. So we didn't have prosecutors until later on in the process. At some point, I realized, oh, we need somebody to represent the people. Uh, you know, when we say the people versus uh, whoever is being charged, that's to say that you you violate the law against the people of that state or that colony. And so, when you have a representative, a prosecutor, a dedicated prosecutor, then they are representing the people, saying, "Hey, you did wrong to the community. I'm going to prove that you did it." So that was the yeah, 17th, 18th centuries when we started getting the the prosecutors as a, as a full time job. We started to see towns uh, be a little bit more established. And, uh, and courts are getting to be a more full-time role, but we still didn't have defense attorneys. One, I mean, you talk about, we were talking about the Miranda case. Anybody remember what year the Miranda, or even give me a, a window of when, when Miranda occurred where, where people were informed that they had the absolute right to representation? Miranda v. Arizona, what year? About around the mid, mid 60s. 65, I believe. Maybe 67. Uh, so if we weren't even telling people that they had the right to, to absolute right to, for representation and have that representation be representation be free of charge and they didn't have to uh, talk when they didn't want to, they could remain silent, they didn't have to answer questions, they could stop answering questions at any time even after they started. If we weren't even telling folks that until the mid-60s, imagine how bad it was in the 1700s when you get charged with a crime. Imagine what they were keeping from you and and folks weren't super educated back then. There wasn't a lot of college education going on. So their idea of the law, one, wasn't was a little naive. And two, we're still working on the common law system. A lot of stuff isn't being written down. You know, is it going to be up to the judge or not at that point when we started prosecutors up to the prosecutor? Uh, folks who just had more, one, uh, information about the system and two, power to, to amend the system. If a judge is appointed by a, a governor who has ultimate authority over the executive, legislative, and judicial branches, and, and you know you have the backing of somebody that uh, 
that you're appointed because you're friends with the governor or something, you know you're gonna have a lot of leeway to make any decision you want. You can you can make poor decisions or even unethical decisions and still get back. So right around the 1730s is when we started using uh, defense attorneys. So now we have a prosecutor on one side, a defense, an actual representation for the defendant, a defense attorney on the other side. So now that we have a judge, a prosecutor, and a defendant, what type of uh, system, instead of being more inquisitional, now what do we have? Adversarial. Exactly, adversarial. So that's when we really started coming to our own as a country. As a judicial, having our own judicial system because we're, we're steering farther and farther away from that that British and common law system to more of an adversarial system and, and really you're starting to see the first uh, the burgeoning uh, beginnings of an American court system instead of a British court getting our own our own feet you know our own personality man that's, that's as a new country it's kind of like a child you, you, as, as we grow as a country we start getting our own personality and start seeing our decisions that we make on our own and getting farther and farther away from, in this case, as a parental figure in the United Kingdom, England. So the court system started uh, started getting bigger, getting more power. Uh, like I said, it started going a little more full time. The uh, caseloads are getting higher and higher. And now power is being kind of taken away from those governors. And you're seeing that separation of powers, the judicial system's having some power and then the legislative system is, is being able to create rules and laws. And there's a little bit of a fight between the, the judicial and the legislative branches. The, even though the legislative branch is creating laws, the judicial branch is, is enforcing, you know, uh, trying and enforcing all those laws and making decisions that may be counterproductive to the legislative branch. There's big, uh, big beef, big conflict between those two branches. In order to maybe come back or, or head off some of that conflict, the towns could start, you know, the governors still were being able to appoint some folks. Or even town heads could appoint some folks. So if the court system is getting more and more power and, and you wanted to see uh, another side of things get more powerful, and you are a mayor or a governor or a region, uh, then what you can do is you can start appointing whoever it is that you want as sheriff. Like if you don't like the way the courts are are judging the laws, well then I'll put somebody in charge who's going to decide who gets arrested. I don't like how this this judge or this prosecutor is is trying cases and, and saying that hey if, uh, if if it's actually true if I do something bad then it's not liable then I'm going to put this. Sheriff in charge. The sheriff will do what I say, and they'll just not arrest who you would have found guilty of a crime. Things like that. But that's where corruption comes into place. If, I, if I'm able to just have absolute power, I say with, with absolute power has the, the ability to corrupt. So, what's what's a bad result of me being able to appoint anybody I want to such a powerful position as a, as a sheriff? Hypothetically, what, what was think of some bad situations that could occur from that? They know, uh, don't like a certain person because, like, they all have it. Right. My family and your family have beef, and then I appoint a, a sheriff that I'm just going to do what I tell him to. And I said, right, I'm like, what? I, I didn't arrest somebody from her family. I was a sheriff. He must have, he must have seen, seen her do something, right? Wasn't me. What if I'm a little short on money? And I know there's a couple people in this room that really want to be sheriff. Like, show me the money. You want to be sheriff? Show me how bad you want it. How much are you willing to pay to be sheriff? At some point, the, the ability to purchase a sheriffship in, the, in those times became so bad and so corrupt that there were almost literally bidding for to become sure. Folks are just like an auction. I mean, if you're buying a position like sheriff, that, I mean, I don't even think we have to talk about how bad that can get. If you're willing to, if you're so corrupt that you're not even sheriff yet and you're breaking the law and you're willing to buy that, think about how bad things are going to be once you do come into that position. So 
so then we started having, you know, realizing, okay, that's that's not great having these appointed sheriffs. So you know, we start, uh, at that point, soon thereafter, the developments to combat that corruption were put in place. We started realizing we should probably elect these sheriffs. And at the same time, we started realizing I don't know how how cool it is having the governor or this, this sole power be the only one who can appoint these judges. Maybe we should give the people some power because that was kind of the whole point of the, the colonies separate from the from England, right? We, we we didn't like necessarily having a rule, a ruler, a, a monarchy telling us what to do. So we decided to become our own country and we're going to tell us what to do. But then we started realizing, well, we still have these rules. We still have these, uh, these shells in place that were just like England, like governors and and, appoint, and sheriffs who could be appointed, and judges who could be appointed, and things like that. And so we started realizing, hey, we, we need to come up with our own rules. And our own rules are, hey, why don't we make some of these, why don't we make these sheriffs elected? Let the people decide. And these judges, you know what? I think a lot of those probably ought to be elected. Some can still be appointed because we don't want to, why, why, why don't we elect, why don't we uh, elect every single judge? Can we think of a downside of electing every federal, state, local, even magistrate judges, bankruptcy judges? What's the downside of, of I mean, I think of, of what I just named is probably thousands of judges. What's the downside of electing thousands of judges every year or every two years? Why wouldn't you want to do that? Do you, I mean, yeah, they're, they're appointed. So many are appointed and many are, are elected. To me, the downside, it's not in the book, but to me, the downside of electing thousands of judges every year would be like, who, who, goes, who wants to go through thousands of pages of, of judges every time you go vote for the governor or the, or the president or, uh, or your city council? Like at some point, you have, to, you have to rely on your representatives to make good decisions. And you, but the difference is your representatives are not like the governor who has that supreme power. So you're going to elect. So we elect our governor, and our governor appoints a lot of those judges. But we also elect a lot of the judges. We have that shared power. One, we have the power to elect the judges that we want. But also, like we said uh, last week and the week before, if we don't like the judges that this, this governor is electing, not only can we say something and not have fear of going to jail, like Sengler did, but we just elect a new governor. So the downside is just logistics. It's just... It's very difficult and very expensive to hold elections for just thousands of people all the time. So we kind of have to share that power and say, all right, well, you, you can appoint some of them, but we're still going to want to elect some too. So we're going to fast forward about 100 years real fast. So Civil War, 1860s, 1861, 1865, that, that area. Uh, Right after that is when we had is the Industrial Revolution. A lot of um, factories are popping up. Technology is, is getting, uh, getting faster, being developed a lot faster. Cities, you know, we have, we're getting away from towns. We're actually getting cities that are growing, metropolis areas, like metropolitan areas. Um, the regions for courts are getting bigger. Court, uh, and in doing so, one, because you have a larger area, courts are going to get bigger. But... In general, uh, what counts as bigger cities? Crime-wise, more or less crime? Yeah, unfortunately, you live in a small town, it's less crime, big, big town, more crime. So our courts are starting to get overwhelmed. We don't have the infrastructure uh, as, a, as the courts were, were so used to this small caseload where they're only handling, sometimes they're only meeting a couple times a year. Now they're becoming overloaded. So, if you were in charge and you saw that you had one courthouse in Raleigh for this entire area and it's getting overwhelmed, what would you do? How would you fix that? If, you, if there's one courthouse in Raleigh for, uh, for maybe 300 miles and they were overwhelmed, how could you? help alleviate that? What are some ways you could, if you were in charge, you had no, money wasn't an issue. Yeah, there you go, more, 
judges, more courthouses they got. That's what they did. So every we started going back to uh, even though the towns were getting smaller, started going back to every town having its own its own small magistrate courthouse and things like that. So kind of having some of those lower level court court cases. One, so we can free up those bigger metropolitan uh, courts for the major cases. And if you had family disputes or uh, you know some civil civil issues or infractions and misdemeanors, you can go back in those smaller courthouses and handle those, those less significant cases, leaving the, the major ones for significant cases. Uh, even small crimes, the like small towns, uh, public drunkenness was was kind of an issue back then. Um, maybe it's still an issue now, but we don't necessarily be uh, uh, we don't necessarily see a lot of folks prosecuted for public drunkenness. I know in in my experience, I a ton of folks that I've taken to jail. So it is against the law to be drunk in public. What is if you were if you were enforcing or writing that law, how would you how would we enforce it? What at what point do you think somebody should go to jail for public drunkenness? <laughs> So bother somebody, yeah. No, they're just like sitting there, you know, feeling about themselves and they're drunk. Like they're not bothering anybody. Right. So if you're in a bar and you're what, what's the level? Point oh eight, I think, is what we're for, or or I say I think I know. Point oh eight is uh, the the level for for driving drunk. Would we use point oh eight as a as a measure of whether or not somebody's drunk in public then, mm-hmm. or is that just a driving thing? Can you still be reasonable, lucid, uh, pleasant at 0.09, 0. 0.10? Yeah. I mean, people go to bars all the time. Everybody that goes to a bar and gets drunk, do they deserve to be arrested for drunk in public? No. So like I said, if they're bothering themselves. So if they're so drunk that they're bothering folks is a, is a good, uh, good indicator. But we also have laws like disturbing the peace and things like that that maybe we could rely on. So if I was just, if, if somebody, if somebody passes out and they're just completely unconscious, do you think they would fit the criteria from the public? And because they're drunk, not, not because they've had medical emergency. They drank so much, so, took so many shots, they started walking to their, uh, walking home, not even walking to their car. Start walking home and just <laughs> gravity took over and they're out. Is that person drunk in public? Yeah. Okay. And they're not bothering anybody, right? They just. So why is that person who isn't bothering anybody, why do you think they should fit the criteria? I'm not saying maybe they should get arrested because they probably not go to the hospital, right? Uh, but why do they fit the criteria for drunk in public? I'm sorry? Yeah. yeah. So we're going to draw that line criminally and enforcement wise, I would say we're going to draw that line at the point where you can't take care of yourself. How does that sound? Right. Unable to care for yourself. Now, if you're point nine, point away, what we said, and you're, you can still, if you're not driving, I mean, that's why we have designated drivers, so you can get over point oh eight. So we know that's not against the law. And if you're able to order another shot, you're probably able to take care of yourself, right? So we have kind of a couple different definitions of drunk. We have driving while intoxicated, which is kind of a misnomer if we call it drunk driving, because are they really it's that same level of drunk? So they can't take take care of themselves, or are they actually intoxicated? That's that's why we use different terminology. And I'll uh, and then you have other levels of drunk when it comes to like drunk service. If you if you're a bartender or a server, and somebody orders, if they're sober, you're allowed to serve them, right? As long as they're of age. But at some point, you have to stop serving them. The law says you can't continue serving a drunk person. Will we still use that 0.08 level for, for that? I would, I would say that the same level or almost the same level of intoxication is probably uh, probably applicable as the drunken public, right? Maybe just slightly less because you're not going to wait until somebody passes out at the bar, but I've seen it. So one of, one of my assignments, uh, in my career was to work in bars, and I, and I shared that with you guys. We used to go into bars and we used to drink. Not a lot, we wouldn't get intoxicated, but we would have a, a, a couple of drinks. And the whole reason there was that we were getting paid to drink in bars was not to, to go party and have a good time, 
one of our primary assignments was to look for folks that are being overserved, either underage service or, or over service, where you would have uh, bartenders who either didn't care because they wanted the tips or uh, weren't paying attention because they were so busy. And somebody was just wasted out of their mind is going up and ordering drinks. How can you tell somebody is shouldn't be served? If you were magically transporting, you guys are all bartenders now. What would you look for to, to and where you would say, eh, not not now? Where's the so that's a that's a huge one. And what you said earlier, I think if you're starting to bother folks, like you're being so belligerent, you're so drunk that you're belligerent. That's another good indicator, symptom, if you will. What else? I was gonna I heard somebody over here. Body language, yeah. Not able to stand. So if that bartender saw all those things, and as an undercover officer, you're in you're in the bar, you're sitting at the bar, and you see all those same things, and you see that the bartender saw all those same things. If that bartender still served that individual, they could be arrested for, for the crime of serving somebody while intoxicated over service. But does that person necessarily need to be the one buying the drink? Is a bartender the only person who's liable for over service? I'll, let me share a story with you. That I, this, this happened to me. So my, my partner and I are both at a bar. We're both sitting at the bar having drinks. And a guy carries a girl. She can't even walk on her own. Her eyes are barely open. He props her up in the seat next to me. He orders a, he orders a shot. Two shots, I'm sorry, or it's two shots. As he's ordering these shots, one for me, one for, I wanna say my girl, but in this case, it was just this girl. Uh, it wasn't even his girl. As he's ordering two shots, she leans over and falls into my lap. And I've gotta pick up this girl, I don't even know, off my lap and prop her back up. She is, uh, I think the, the medical term is toe up from the flow up. She's wasted. He orders two shots. He takes one. He gives her one. She shoots it. Her eyes close, and her friend comes and kind of intervenes and realizes what's going on. What's going on there? What, why do you think he's trying to get her that? And bad news, right? Bad mojo. So while she passed over, I'll back up a little bit. In this particular case, when she ringed over in my lap, and I had to pick her back up and the bartender came back over. I told the bartender in certain words, holy moly, she is uh, quite intoxicated. Uh, and he's like, yeah, I know, right? And then he hands her and him a shot. And then that's what happens. He takes his shot, she takes her shot, her friend sees what's going on. I would say rescue spur. But by rescuing her means she carried this girl whose eyes weren't even open all the way to the bathroom. Who overserved that girl? I would agree with you, but why? So she said both of them. The bartender obviously saw that she was like, she even made it clear he was afraid of you saying, like, yeah, I understand. He understood that. And then also, the guy that was carrying the girl over to the bar saw and understood that she could barely, he had a proper tool to just give her another shot. And then she fell into a stranger's lap, yeah. unbeknownst to, to her, fortunately, fell into uh, another cover officer's lap. Um, so, why was it why was it so important for me to say that what I said? And to the bartender, as an investigator, why, why did I say that? Did, was I just making conversation when I said that, do you think? Do you think I had a plan for why I said that? Why was it? Yeah. When I wrote that report later, do you think that me, that little comment that I made and his response made it into that report? Yeah. Heck yeah. So, yes, I, to, to answer you, to, to validate your, your answer, yes, I agree that if both of those individuals uh, served that young lady and I do believe that that young lady's friend who came over, while she could have been rescued sooner, uh, probably prevented some bad things from happening. But that, that type of thing, that type of drunk, drunk in public, while we don't, you know, we, we still see it now, and, and maybe has 
uh, less uh, stigma attached to it, it's less enforced. You know, I mean, I, I would dare say if we go to bars uh, every night this year, we're probably not going to see somebody get arrested for uh, being drunk in public. It just doesn't happen that often the way it did back then in the stigma. But because it, even though it happened a lot, it was very, it's still a lower level crime. So these towns were handling those, those types of crimes. Prostitution was another one. Just a little kind of uh, what we call quality of life. The reason we have these laws in place, the reason we have drunk in public, prostitution, gambling, is because we like the way our life is now without those things. And they're just incrementally uh, encroaching upon our quality of life. If you let people, if you let prostitutes uh, street walk up in front of people's houses, it's just not. When you leave your house, it doesn't. You don't like your life as much as if there weren't prostitutes there. If there wasn't needles on the ground or, or people doing drugs in front of your house or uh, a, a casino next door that's drawing a, a CD element, uh, you know, an underground illegal casino or uh, just drunk folks all over the place. That, that's the, that category of crimes we call quality of life. It's just, it's not gonna be major significant penalties, but they're just gonna make you feel more comfortable in where you live. And so these towns that had these individual, as we got back to, to the individual town judges again, away from the big city metropolitan courthouses, uh, we were allowing these small towns, and I say we as a, as a burgeoning country in the 1860s, we're allowing these small towns to police themselves or judge themselves, have courts for those minor crimes, quality of life crimes again. But like everything, we keep going back and forth. And we started out with these town judges, and then we kind of we got to the, the city judges as we got bigger, we realized we, we needed to expand again, and we expanded to these cities. And, and the same problem happened. Now we've got too many courthouses with not, not enough supervision. We need to consolidate. One of the states that gave, it's in the book, uh, one of the states that has a, a good example of successful consolidation is California. California went from having just all these willy-nilly town judges, county judges, state judges, and federal judges. Uh, I'll take, federal's already, already covered. But you, you know, you've got all these different layers of counties and excuse me, different municipalities and different minor judges and major judges, intermediate judges, appellate judges, state level judges, Supreme Court judges. And they said, enough. Let's just, let's just get three levels. We're just going to have the one level that hears the, the normal cases in the federal court system. We call the the, the, uh, the lower courts. We're going to have the, the state level lower courts that hear the cases. If you don't like the result of that case, then you can appeal. And it'll go to the state appellate court. If you don't like that, you can go to the state Supreme Court. But that's it. We're not going to keep having all these different uh, town and county and, and crazy willy-nilly levels of judges that, that take one takes a lot of money to have all these different courthouses, all these different prosecution levels, prosecutor levels, all these different defense levels, county clerks. There's going to be admin staff and all these different courthouses, all these different levels. Especially as we got into times like the recession, 2008, courthouses they contracted even more after that. Before 2008, when California gave the example of how to consolidate. But it showed why it worked because when when money dried up, California was able to still successfully uh, run their court systems. And a lot of other states have seen, you know what? Maybe we don't need all these crazy willy nilly uh, levels. Let's just go with a, an entry level, hear the cases, an appellate level, and a Supreme Court. But we're, the difference is, unlike the federal court system, we have different names for them. So, but in in general, you'll see those same levels being uh, being used. But New York may call it something different than California. So you compare that to uh, the, the example in the book is Indiana. California and Indiana are kind of polar opposites in the way they do their, their court system. How many, how many levels do we take California has? I'm going to say it's three. Uh, Indiana, anybody read how many levels they have? Ten. That's just that's excessive and as far as being able to run a run a budget and be able to allot enough money to to run your court system when you have 10 different levels it's going to get uh, laborious and expensive
I, we went over this a little bit in the federal system, but so it's a little bit of review, but I want to go over what types of cases can be in the lower level courts. Give me some examples of what the, the lower courts are going to hear in that consolidated system that California and a few other states have. I don't want to get into the, the 10 levels. Sure. Yeah, I mean, obviously a family court, while well, family court is emotional and major for the participants in that family court, whether it be divorce, adoption, losing a kid, social services, like those are very significant events in somebody's life. But if you look at it as a scheme of the, how the courts are run, it's a minor case for the courts, a major case for the participants. So don't, I don't, by no, by no means do I uh, knock how significant it is if you ever end up in family court, but if you look at the court system, they are fairly minor courts. A lot of those are run by magistrates. And, uh, and not even uh, full judges. But yeah, so you can have uh, magistrates can also at lower level can hear uh, infraction cases. They, you don't necessarily have the right to a jury trial for those because it's not a misdemeanor, but it's still in that state, uh, state system. We're not gonna have just little municipal traffic courts. We may have a court that is dedicated to just hearing traffic cases, like a courtroom, or if you're a big enough municipality like Los Angeles, there are certain courthouses, small ones, but certain courthouses where that's all they hear is traffic events, cases. But it's, it's not the most exciting, no. Uh, but it is still a state court. Like it's still lower level state court that hears traffic offenses, as opposed to being, um, there's one in, in San Fernando, which is a small town just inside Los Angeles. Los Angeles is made up sometimes of, uh, there are island towns. Have you ever heard of the term island town? Within Los Angeles, there are municipalities that are not Los Angeles. So you've heard of Beverly Hills? Beverly Hills is not Los Angeles, it's its own town. It's, for the most part, I mean, it's got some weird borders, but for the most part, it's it's surrounded by other, uh, San Fernando is another one, Culver City, these are all their own towns, but you have to go through Los Angeles to get them. So it doesn't matter what town you're in, if it's a state court, right? So San Fernando, which is its own town, has a uh, criminal, court, okay, criminal courthouse and a, a uh, traffic courthouse or had a traffic courthouse. The entire the entire courthouse, that's all they heard was traffic cases, but it was still a state courthouse. No matter Los Angeles, San Fernando, or, or, or San Francisco, it's it's still part of the state system. We don't have those smaller uh, courthouses anymore. So yes, those are the types of cases. Uh, so the but they're also gonna hear other cases. So those are, are the, the minor versions of those courthouses, but we're also, it says we're all, we have a lower entry level courthouse, the same level is going to hear felony cases, right? Uh, not federal felonies, but state felonies. Our entry level, our, our superior courts, the entry level. From there, we're gonna have our state appellate courts. They're going to hear the appeals cases. Uh, and they're also going to be able to uh, send cases to the state Supreme Court. State Supreme, remember we, uh, if we don't like a decision from the state Supreme Court, what's our option? That's the highest it goes in the state, right? But you still can, you still have the option to appeal. Who are we gonna to appeal to if we don't like the state Supreme Court decision? Very close. It can. We, what we said last week was the Supreme Court has the option of hearing a case. They can pick a case out of the out of the pipeline. But one of the uh, the uh, primary rules about that is that that case has to at least be heard by the state Supreme Court first, and then the U.S. Supreme Court can look at it, with some exceptions. But if we don't, in general, if we don't like the results and we want to appeal the state Supreme Court case, we go to a federal appellate court. So we wouldn't go to a federal entry level court, right? A lower level court because they only hear what what is the what is lower level federal courts here? Criminal cases, like a federal, a federal crime. So we can't appeal from a state Supreme Court to a court that hears crimes because remember, we don't we don't retry our cases. We only hear we only try the the one thing we're appealing about our case. If we think something was unconstitutional about our case, 
they were saying, hey, can you, as an appeal appellate court, look at this one thing and tell me, was that wrong or was that right? Because I feel like it was wrong and they probably shouldn't have searched my car. Not, hey, I, don't, I was found guilty and can you retry my case? We don't do that. So I don't think it was right the way they searched my car. And I go to, I get arrested and my case is heard at the lower level, California State Court. I don't like it. They found me guilty of whatever it was that was in my car that they arrested me for. I'm like, no, they, the way they searched my car was illegal. They didn't have a warrant. My car had four flat tires. And that means that you need a warrant, which is true. In general, you don't need a warrant for vehicles because vehicles can drive away. So there's an exception to search warrants. Vehicle exception it says, hey, if you need, if you have probable cause to search a vehicle, and in, and there's something in there you think you think there's some criminal uh, evidence in there, you can search it and just detail what probable cause you have. Because if you leave and go get a search warrant, what's going to happen to that car? Yeah, it's going to take off, and it's not going to be there when you come back with the warrant. A house isn't going anywhere. A car is, so that's why they're exception. So in this case, I'll say, hey, no, 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 no. My car had four flat tires. It couldn't have gone anywhere. They, they should have gotten a warrant. And that's kind of a gray area, right? Like, maybe, I don't know. We should probably ask a judge. So I get found guilty. I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm going to the California appellate court. And the appellate court goes, no, nah, I don't know, man. It did have four flat tires, but it's still a car. And they don't need a search warrant for a car. And they say, we're just going to, no, you're still guilty. And then, so I go to the state Supreme Court. And when I go to the Supreme Court, do I say, hey, I want a new trial. Uh, hear, hear my entire case. No. Now, what, what, do I ask, what do I ask the state Supreme Court to look at? Yeah, just that one warrant. Like, no, 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 Supreme Court, tell me. Did they need a warrant or not? Because I don't think they needed one. Or I, I think they did, and they didn't get one. And Supreme Court's going to look at it and be like, ah, you know what, it's a, a car. I mean, we, we're, we're thinking it over. Yeah, it had four flat tires, and maybe they, it's a three-judge panel, and then they think, and two of them, two of them say, no, nah, that's a car. Either way, it's a car. They don't need a warrant for a car, right? And the one guy's like, ah, you know what? It was, but they had four flat tires. I think, I think they needed a warrant. So two to one, I lose. I'm like, ah, oh, I'm getting some progress here. Somebody's starting to agree with me. I'm going to appeal again. So where do I go? The U.S. appellate courts, federal appellate courts. And I ask them, do I get a new trial with the appellate court? Or why don't I go to the, the lower level federal court? Why did I go to the appellate court for the federal appellate court? Why didn't I go to the lower level federal court? Right. One, it wasn't a federal crime, so they can't hear a federal case. And two, I'm not getting a case, right? I'm, I'm not getting a, a trial. I'm getting, hey, I just want to know about that warrant question. I really think I'm right about this warrant question. So I go to the federal appellate court, which is a panel. And they look at it, and they're only going to look at the one thing that I asked the court or the uh, the warrant. And if they say, "You know what? That's a really, really good question," but we just think we think it's a car. I mean, it's, it's a, the bottom line is at the end of the day, it's a car. And the rule is, if it's a car, regardless of how many flat tires it has, they don't need a warrant. They, sorry. So we're going to let the, the way it's been. We're going to, we're going to uphold the, the state Supreme Court's decision. And then, what do I do? If I don't like the, the decision of that federal appellate court, what, what are my options? Who can I, who can I go to next? Is there anybody left for the federal appellate court? To the Supreme Court? Yeah, I can. What do I have to do? What, what do I have to, what kind of paperwork do I have to do if I want them to hear it? There's a very specific type of paperwork. You'll probably see someplace again. I'll give you the first part. Writ of? Writ of cert. Exactly. I have to write a writ of cert for my representation. That's right of register. And then it goes to the Supreme Court. There's nine people, nine judges on the Supreme Court. When they review that bit of cert, how many people have to agree 
the, yeah, that's a really good question. We never thought of that. Like, what if there are four flat tires? Man. Very close. Four. So a minority gets to decide. A minority of, of the number gets to decide whether they hear it. That way the majority can't can't prevent cases from, from being heard. If four Supreme Court judges hear my case and think, man, that's that's a pretty good question. Black tires? I don't know, man. We should probably so then it goes to the Supreme Court. Am I gonna get a new trial? And when I go to the Supreme Court, am I getting uh, my trial at the Supreme Court? Same thing. All they're going to hear is just that one question. And there's two ways they can hear that question. Let me tell me one of those two ways they can hear that question. It's going to get presented to them. How? I've got to communicate with them somehow. I've got to communicate my argument. My, my representation is going to give them an argument as to why I'm right. Why? Four flat tires means you need a warrant. How are, how are my representing? How are my attorneys going to communicate that information to the Supreme Court? Are you gonna text them? Email? I'm sorry. I'm, one more time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Verbal arguments. Verbal arguments is one. Of them. You can actually go before the Supreme Court and just argue your case or your attorney's work. But not all. That's the most obvious, right? And then you can write them down and just submit them. I'm gonna, your attorneys can say, hey, here's, write a brief. This is, this is everything that we wanted to say. I don't necessarily need to come in front of you to say it because I wrote it all down for you. So written arguments or oral arguments. Those are the two ways that you can have your case heard before the Supreme Court. And then they're gonna render their decision. It's, oftentimes it's going to be a split decision you can have some folks that say yes and some folks that say no. You can have a, and whoever wins, again, this is a, a review, Wh whoever's in that, whoever has more votes is going to be the majority opinion. And whoever has the least number of votes, not the minority opinion, is the dissenting opinion. And each, a person on each side has to write that up. The whatever side that the chief justice is on gets to decide who's going to write it up for their side. So if the chief justice is on the, the side that has the most votes, the, the winning side, if you will, the, the majority opinion, then the chief justice just decides, uh, you know, you, you write this up this time. The chief justice can write it up. And then whoever is the senior judge on the, uh, the minority side, they get to decide. That is your your uh, introduction to state courts and review of federal courts. Any questions? All right. Have a good night.